case you haven't guessed it, is a conference room. I'm Phil Hyatt, conference leader. And I'm mighty glad to see you out there. It's gonna be nice to have someone in my corner for a change. You know, it's a funny thing about conferences. The people who attend them, like the gang that'll be in here in about uh, 15 minutes, they never come alone. Oh, you can't actually see the others they bring along, but you can feel them all around the room. People who affected them 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago. You can't see them, but you know they're there. So, this time I'm bringing my gang along. That's you. And together we'll ride through this conference, sharing the successes, if any, with the bumps, which will be plenty. You see, half the people coming here today hate conferences. Some of them don't like each other. And some, you'll be ready to swear, don't like anybody. Oh, it's a tough job, fellas. Part traffic cop, part varsity coach, with a touch of Klondike Miner thrown in. And you can bet we'll have to dig for our gold in some unlikely looking hills. How'd we ever get into this spot? Well, a few hours ago, it was just another morning, till the 10 o'clock mail came in, and uh, this letter hit the old man's desk. In view of the repeated delays in delivery from your company, we are herewith canceling all orders effective immediately. Well, when I got to the boss's office, the temperature had dropped 60 degrees. Hyatt, he said, round up every supervisor in the place that has anything to do with a D87 model and sit them down together. I don't want any more explanation. I want results. So, here I am. There's your list, Mr. Hyatt. Oh, thanks. Now, let's see, uh, Alden, Matthews. Say, what about somebody from advertising? It isn't strictly their baby, but the boss said to round up everybody connected with this model. Let's get a hold of Ed Conover. These advertising birds are usually idea men. He might come up with something helpful. Yes, sir. Anybody else before I start phoning? Why, uh... That little man in inspection, uh, what's his name? Fairweather. Yes, Bernie Fairweather. Right. Oh, well, there's one of our people out in the hall now. Mr. Matthews. Uh, yes? Departmental conference this afternoon, Doug. Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Uh, all right. He's been here longer than the old man. What's he worried about? It's a habit. Some people chew gum. Doug worries. Dealer in the Midwest. All right, all right, Morell. Get to the point, will you? I'm busy. The point? A new customer should have priority. Look, Morell, all I know is I got a hold up shipment. That means somebody didn't do his job right. Are you trying to imply that I'm not I... implying anything? I'm just telling you. You're telling me how to run the sales department? Well, it so happens I could teach you. You the... couldn't teach me the alphabet. That is, if you knew it. Hello? Hmm. Yes. Oh, this is Miller, Miss Chapman. What time? I see. Who else is coming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Morell's down there now. All right, I'll tell him. The conference at 3 o'clock. Right, we can't make exceptions. You want the machine fixed, you'll have to send for a maintenance man. Send for a maintenance man? Come argue with McGregor? Stand around and wait for inspection, then production will be on my neck. How the hell am I supposed to be a schedule? Don't ask me, Sam. I'm only telling you what's in the union contract. Oh. Hello, Alden. What? Three o'clock. Okay. Okay. A conference. That's all I need. Fairweather speaking. Who? Yes, Mr. Hyatt's office. You what? My opinion. Yes, certainly I'll be there. Thank you, Miss Chapman. Thank you. My opinion. They like to have my opinion and my ideas. <laughs> You're what? Get wise to yourself, Fairweather. You haven't had an idea in 42 years. Furthermore, I will not permit our boy to enroll at your dear old alma mater. 
I've seen the kind of specimens your school turns out. And I won't have such... Miss Ferguson, would you come in, please? And bring our complete file on the D87 model? I'd like to dictate a memo. I tried to call you, but there was no answer. Well, I, uh, I, I guess maybe the phone isn't working today. The phone. Or something. Well, four minutes to go. You do what you can to get ready. Remind yourself of the key steps in a conference, the way it says in a book. Present the problem. Draw out the conference members. Evaluate the proposals, sum up the conclusion. But let's face it, you can block out your conference in advance, you can make your plans, but you can't really count on them to work. Because the big element in any conference is the people. And that's always an unknown. Oh, sure. You may have seen them around the shop, jotted down a few notes here and there. But people, like icebergs, are seven-eighths below the surface. You've got to deal with twists and curves that have been forming for a lifetime. Plus, their particular problems of the moment. Not to mention those little distractions that make the best of us wander now and then. I have the name cards ready, Mr. Hyatt. Whom do we put where? That's a good question. Whenever you can, you group your people like an orchestra leader does, so the drums don't drown out the oboe. I beg your pardon? Hmm? Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> now, uh, let's see. Our, uh, our big talker is Roy Judson. So we'll put him over here in the blind spot, where I can accidentally overlook him or cut him off fast. With Sam Alden alongside? Oh, no. Sam's one of our real strong boys. I want him down there in the anchor spot. What'll I do with Mr. Miller of shipping? Would this be all right? Oh, sure. Miller's going to be trouble no matter where you put him. Just my luck he's not on his vacation. As far as the rest of them go, just put him anywhere and we'll hope for the best. What about Mr. Fairweather? Should we do something special about him? Oh, you're darn right we should. Put him back here next to me where I can prop him up if necessary. They'll be along any second now. From here on in, you're on your own. Well, I'll flash you when I can, but right now, we're off to the wars. Hiya, Phil. I haven't seen you in a week. How's the boy? Oh, just fine, Roy. Oh, Phil, you ought to give up cigarettes. Yeah. Get in on a real smoke. Well, thanks just the same, Roy, but, uh... Oh, hello, Doug. Come on in. I think you're down there. Hi, Ed. Glad to see you with oh, us. Hi. Uh, tell me, hi, how long is this thing liable to run? Until we come up with an answer. Oh, no. <laughs> now, there's a fine, constructive Great. attitude. Uh, but I'm more worried about this fellow coming in. He's a top engineer, but he, he doesn't see any point in conferences. Figures the front office should solve its own problems, preferably by calling on its college kids, oh, by which he means anybody under 45. Well, gentlemen, I, uh, I think we're all here now. Will that be all, Mr. Hyatt? Yes, thank you. Fellas, the boss asked me to call this meeting because we're in a jam. This morning, we had the third major cancellation in a week, all for the same reason, failure to meet delivery. Now, I don't have to tell you what this means in, in terms of the future of our company, and therefore of each one of us, unless we do something about it. So, there's our problem. Now, when I say our problem, I mean just that. I happen to be sitting up here as a matter of convenience, but this is something for all of us to solve together. So let's get to the kickoff, huh? Sam, you're about as close to this as anybody. You have any ideas? That's a big one, Phil. I only work around here. 
Something's eating him, but we can't stop to find out what. Well, maybe we can dig into this from the production side. What do you say, Doug? Do you think the bottleneck could be anywhere in production? Oh, uh, well, uh, I'd say, uh, I mean, it could be a lot of things. <laughs> That's the way it goes some days. Your key people just aren't with you. But you've got to get rolling somehow, even if it means calling on some windbag who wanders all over the map and has to be steered home. I hate to do this, but, uh, well, this is the kind of person you can count on to get your action started. Let's see if we can keep him down to five minutes. Suppose we ask the man who deals with the customer. How's it look from the sales angle, Don? Well, sure, something's got to be done. But our job is just to get the orders. How about that? Nine times out of ten, you'd have to shoot this guy down. Today, he can't even get off the ground. Well, you see what I mean? We sure are off to a great start. Just look at those faces. Now, there's a concentrated, intelligent expression. Uh-oh. This will never do. We need a fresh attack. And here's where that advanced planning comes in handy. One way to get a group moving is to get them to analyze the problem systematically, step by step. Fellas, suppose we take a typical order and trace all the steps it goes through up to final delivery. Now remember, this is what we're shooting for. Now we start here, where the order comes in. Okay, Steve, what happens to an order when it hits the mail room? It's broken down according to the product requested and then sent on to the proper section in accounts receivable. Okay. Accounts, receivable. All right, Roy, what do your people do? Well, Phil, we've got a pretty nice setup. We'll yank out one copy for billing purposes, send one to the customer, and one to sales for their statistics. Now, that leaves us the master copy to be relayed to production for action. Now, this requires careful handling. So all our clerks are instructed, and I take care of this myself personally, you know, I think it's a best practice in a matter like this if oh, you very yourself... very good. Very good, Roy. But uh, is there any way this process might be uh, expedited? Uh, not at our end, but... Um... But what, Roy? Well, you see, we've got two men over in accounts. Jim Harris and Wilbur Harrison. Now, Harris, that's Jim. He takes care of the D87 orders, and Harrison is on the F models. But sometimes a master copy of an 87 order is sent by mistake to Harrison. That's Wilbur. And then he has if to see... If that's happening, it's the VP's office that's responsible. The master on all 87 orders goes up front to Mr. Gilbert, the VP for sales. We have a special request on it. What? Mr. Gilbert asked for that just as a spot check during the period when our suppliers weren't coming through. Sure. That should have been canceled three months ago. Well... Thanks for telling me. Well, you must have had a memo on it. Now, wait a minute, fellas. Looks to me as if we found a place right here where we can speed things up. Why don't you get together with Roy tomorrow, say, uh, 11 o'clock, straighten out the details? Well, that's that. Yeah, we sure polished that one off fast. <laughs> now, take it easy, Ed. Let's keep things in perspective. Clearing up this mix-up on the mails will probably save us two or three hours. But our deliveries have been running behind by two or three days. So, uh, let's go ahead with tracing our imaginary order. Now, the next stop along the line is production. Okay, Doug. Now the order's in your lap. Your move, Doug. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? See a doctor about it. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very funny, Doug. I, uh, I guess you mean an obstetrician. A doctor will help us with delivery. <laughs> but seriously, fellows, we're trying to get after these delays. See a doctor. That's a hot one. <laughs> well, I'll tell you where you can start. With sales. 
Half the orders that come into the plant have to be rechecked because the language is no good. It's too vague. The specifications aren't complete. So production has to get on the phone and chew up valuable time. Now, wait While a minute. While the salesman is out making more wild promises. Let's not put the rap on the fellas out in the field just because they're not here to defend themselves. What I mean is, sure, a salesman may skip a detail now and then when he's out grabbing a tough customer on the run, but we get the orders, don't we? And what does it all come to? A phone call now and then. Don't tell me that's where the trouble lies. No, sir. Let's look at it this way, Phil. If your car breaks down on the road, what do you do? Do you go fussing about the windshield wiper or worry about the door handle? No. You go right to the heart of the matter, the engine, the place where the spark is made. And that's what we ought to be doing, concentrating on the place where the product is made. Why, there's an old Chinese saying, he who see... No, that isn't the one. Uh... In other words, Don, you feel that Sam's operation is the key to the problem. Absolutely. He's right, Phil. No getting away from it. Not much we can do about turning the stuff out faster. Talk to Sam. The parts don't match up, Sam. Maintenance can't handle it. It isn't up to standard, Sam. We have to stop the production line. We're running late, Sam. Now hold it. I'm sick and tired of being the whipping boy if everything goes wrong around here. Why didn't somebody tell the truth for a change? All right. I'll tell you why we can't push two things on time. Because we have fancy inspection standards. Because the design engineers are always pulling last minute switches while some bright idea is the method runs into stuff my production line. Because every time I need a break from shipping, I get a song and dance about overtime. Oh, so Sam, overtime, what are you talking about? Anywhere. Shipping just won't play ball. That's what I was saying this morning. You're right, Don. You know, I've had some of that trouble myself. Okay, yes, man. I'd rather have a yes man around than a no man. Oh, yeah. But you know, for three weeks, I was waiting for some wait, three weeks. Weeks. Sometimes arguments are helpful, but not this kind. We'll have to break this up without stepping on anybody's toes and put all this energy to work where it'll do some good. All right, fellas. All right. Now, let's remember what we're here for. Suppose we try to boil down our objective a little. What we've got to do is this. And we'll never do it by pulling in opposite directions. Let's see if we can't get together on a few things. Now, Sam mentioned production materials that clash with inspection standards. Anybody want to comment on that? What about this question of design engineering changes? Uh, where do you think the main conflict is there, Russ? There's no conflict that I'm aware of. I get my orders from up front and follow through on them as rapidly as possible. I suggest other departments should do the same. This looks like one of those murderous days. Get a load of that guy. There's one at every conference, and no department has a monopoly on them. But you can't let them throw you. Let's bear down on this, gentlemen. We've heard several different approaches here, but I'm sure we haven't canvassed all the possibilities. Isn't there some idea we've left out? Roy? Don? How do you like that? First they charge off in every direction, and then they come to a dead stop. And that's your worst point in a conference. Well, everybody's talked now except Bernie Fairweather, and nobody's heard a word out of him since the Coolidge administration. But that's my mistake, letting him sit there without taking part. And it's a mistake many a conference leader's made before me. It's the old story. The squeaking wheel gets the grease, and the Fairweathers are left silent. Well, it's time we rewrote that one. There are ways of getting a quiet man to talk, so let's try one and see how it works. Bernie, with all your experience in inspection, I'm sure you can be of some real help on this problem. Now, let's take today, for example. Approximately how many rejects would you say you've had so far? Exactly 17. That is up to five minutes before three, but I have an idea that may help, if I can continue. Oh, yes, certainly, go ahead. We sure need some ideas. You know, I don't like to send things back for not meeting standards, but what can I do? I mean, sales and engineering set the standards, and it's up to me to see that they're met. I don't want anybody to think I'm criticizing, but, well, I've been working on a little plan. You see, we've been using the same technical standard for both our top-grade model, the D91, 
and our cheaper model, the 87, offering in both cases a lifetime guarantee. But the fact of the matter is, nobody wants to use the 87 for more than five or 10 years. I have a few customer letters here from the sales department confirming the point. That means we've been causing ourselves unnecessary delay by rejecting D87 materials, which are actually quite adequate for their purpose. We could eliminate this time loss by developing a separate set of standards for the 87 based on a 15-year guarantee, which is still five more years of service than anyone wants to get out of it. Now, there's nothing revolutionary about this idea. We've used it on other lines. But I think it would cut down the delay that Mr. Hyatt is worried about. And this is the guy I put next to me so he wouldn't clam up. But he's made his point. We can't let this turn into a lecture meet. By this method, I estimate we could speed up deliveries by more than 20%. Thanks, Bernie. That's a very stimulating proposal. Uh, don't you agree, Sam? Well, I don't know. Sounds to me like twice as much trouble out on the floor. Two sets of figures to argue about, two operations for methods to mess around with. Say, that's the second time you've mentioned methods. Let's get one of their people in here. The changeover won't be too complicated, Sam. I've got a system all worked out. It's easy, Sam. All you have to do is take Fairweather's jigsaw puzzle and put it together. <laughs> <laughs> it's now or never for this conference. We've made a start, and we can't afford to slide back. Thanks, Bernie. You've made a real contribution. And I think the rest of us should be able to follow through on it. Now, let's see how we stand. We still have our problem of eliminating delay, but we saved a few hours by straightening out the flow of papers, and now Bernie's come up with something that looks as though it might save day. How about each one of us thinking over his own operation, see if we can find some way to, to turn Bernie's idea into time saved. Russ, you've been around here longer than any of us, and your judgment's valued accordingly. Would you say that uh, this modification of the D87 standard would, uh, would present an impossible designing problem? No, I never said impossible. Well, uh, exactly what would you have to do? Well, you might want to reset our test equipment, that's all. Precisely. But would our customers be satisfied with the change? Well, heck, Russ, I'm more concerned about that than you are, but the customer would still be getting 50% more than he wants. What about sales, Hyatt? That's where you're going to get your squawks. Well, I think we can leave it to Don Morell to work that out. Well, sure. That's part of a salesman's job, to protect your goodwill. I mean, it's simply a question of making sure that the dealer understands what's going on, that the customer isn't losing out in any way. That's now, you do. take the average dealer. I've got a bump. He going to argue with yeah. you when you prove to him that he isn't so really having anything Don't taken Don't you know away. what that means? Oh, that now, there are a number of ways mean. in which you can handle Don't this. Give me the idea that... I remember oh, one time at the West... Oh, 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 oh. Well, you crazy man. That's just a natural bone formation. Look, everybody's got it right there. Well, I'll be done. Sure, that's just part of your sternum, man. Sternum? Yeah. <laughs> sternum? Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, uh, Don Morell's just been telling us how sales would handle this uh, separate standard for the D87. He'd have a simple, direct explanation made to the dealer. I think we'd all like to hear what adjustments you can foresee in production. Uh, separate standard, uh... Oh, you mean Fairweather's idea? Well, uh, I can see one good thing right away. We'll be able to use second-grade materials that we've been scrapping. Uh, that'll save us time on the 87s. Do huh? you suppose we can work with this idea to take some of the pressure off, Sam? Well, uh, let's see now. Uh, yes. We could make a preliminary check on incoming materials and put all the doubtfuls on one side. That way, Sam won't run into any substandard parts on his top-grade model. Now you're talking, Doug. Uh, Don, uh, on those mix-ups on orders, I think we can dope out a way to lick that. Say, uh, maybe what you fellas need is a basic form. Right, remember that A11 we used to have? Now, we could modify I that. I think the B-series was more practical. No point in taking up everybody's time on this one, Doug. Uh, why don't you drop in at Doug's office tomorrow around uh, 10? I'll join you, and we'll work it out together. Right, fine. Now we're rolling. But we can't really wrap this up unless Sam Alden comes along. Did you send for me, Phil? Uh, excuse me. Yes, and I'm sorry I overlooked doing it earlier, one of those slips. We've been kicking around some notions on how to speed up deliveries, Larry, and we could use a hand from Methods. Grab yourself a chair. Here's our chance to pull Sam Alden in by appointing him spokesman for the group. Okay, Larry. Sam, will you fill Larry in on this proposal of Bernie Fairweather's? 
Well, the main idea is to set up a new standard for the D87, instead of having it meet the same tests as the 91. Like it is now, we're making the 87 stand up to a lifetime quality test. According to Fairweather, nobody wants to use it that long. Maximum use wanted is 10 years, and we can easily cover that with a 15-year guarantee. Say, that's quite a thought, Mr. Fairweather. And I can see a methods angle, too. That's what I was afraid of. Oh, now look, Sam. We can make a few new jigs to accommodate the oversized parts we've had to throw out up to now. Uh, like this. Not bad, Sam. Yeah? What about stock storage for both sets of parts? You've got a point there, Sam. Any idea how we could get around that? Well, there may be a possible way. Doug, you remember those old bins we locked in the stock room? You mean use them? Why not? They're lying idle now. Now we're really off to the races. The best thing we can do at this point is right, to Russ. leave the right. boys alone. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> Okay, I can do that. I guess we could phone you in advance on changes, Sam, if it would help. It sure would. I see what you mean, Don. If, if I could just find a way of handling my overtime. Look, Cliff, I... as long as you know what I mean, I'm not worried about the rest. Fellas, this is what we've achieved. First, we've uncovered a minor misunderstanding between mails and accounts receivable that will be ironed out at a meeting tomorrow. Second, we found a number of places where cooperation can be improved. And we'll discuss action on these at separate meetings over the next few days. Finally, we've come up with an important new idea that'll be implemented by the departments involved. I'll send each one of you a reminder of the action you've agreed to. Thank you, gentlemen, and good afternoon. Well, it sure saw that one. I'll see you all later, fellas. Thanks, Bernie. Bernie, right. Bernie, Oh, Roy, I'm glad to have you there on my left hand. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Cup of coffee, Bernie? Cafeteria should still be open. Oh, uh, I'm buying. Well, gentlemen. Thanks, Roy. Goodbye, Mr. Hyatt. <laughs> Bye, Bernie. Oh, come on here. So long, fellas. Come on, Roy. So long, fellas. Well, there were a couple of times I thought we'd never make it. But we did. And I'm glad you came along. Oh, I'm, I, I'm terribly sorry. Uh-oh. I'll be back with you in a minute. So long, Phil. How'd we make out, Mr. Hyde? Well, we got uh, nine out of ten. Not a bad batting average. Not bad at all. Nine men who have not only agreed on a solution, but who, who feel they're a part of it. It's a solution they'll carry out, too. Because they've thought it through for themselves created it in terms of their, their own problems and needs. And that, after all, is what a conference leader's for. Not to be a mastermind dictating the answer, but to, to make men think. And any time you can achieve that, well, what do you think? business today involves the element of chance because there are many risks. Since the day I went into business for myself, to remind me of the gamble in doing business, it's helped me to find the hidden key to business survival and success. I say gamble in doing business because of the risks involved, risks that maybe you haven't thought about lately. The risk of the availability of working capital is present in the small as well as the expanding business. There are many influences from the outside that become risks, from the inevitable high taxes to the important job of timely deliveries. The problems of product obsolescence, increased competition, reduced profit margins, all involve risks. There's the risks are involved in doing business today. 
However, there is a factor that takes much of this gamble out of business, and that's the human element, the most essential element to business success. This trio is that human element, with ambition and ability and teamwork. This is Waller, with a knack for overall organization and thorough handling of details. He has good connections at the bank. I wouldn't worry about it, either of you. I'm sure we'll get the loan. This is George, an expert on any production problem. With his easy smile and quick humor, he's very good at handling employees. Just give me one more lathe and an operator. Yes, the team had two Mr. Insides and Bob, Mr. Outside. A good mixer, a low handicap golfer, and the best contacts in the field, plus the ability to follow them up and make sales. And all I have to do is get the business. And if you don't, Bob, we'll give you the business. <laughs> <laughs> Take it from me. Three men like that make quite a team. I'm Bill Edwards. And since I believe that next to knowing your own business, you should know the business of your competitors, I can tell you quite a bit about Bob, Walter, and George. They were our top competition. They became partners because each man's talents and personality blended into a fine working combination. After the usual growing pains, they incorporated to avoid unnecessary income taxes and to limit their personal liability. Let me tell you what happened. A hard to beat team, these competitors of mine, always moving ahead. Walter had swung the loan at the bank and they really got busy. They weren't afraid of work and were often hard at it far into the night. Since their families were close friends, they could combine business with pleasure. Oh, say, Bob, Ruth called late this afternoon, said she couldn't get hold of Mary today. She wants you to ask her about the barbecue Sunday at our house. Uh, George and Helen are coming. We are? Well, you can see who's boss at his house. <laughs> well, maybe we ought to have the wives boss the outfit. Yeah, I can see that. They know as much about running this business as we do about cooking. <laughs> oh, uh, which reminds me, Walter, are you planning to cremate the steaks again? Please, Walter, not that. Now, don't worry, George. I have a brand new system. Yeah, but I got the same old stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Working together as a team, these three men did all they could to take the risks out of doing business. They had protection against many types of losses. They insisted on careful maintenance to keep equipment in top condition. Good working surroundings and benefits kept employees happy. And yet, they gambled. They gambled on the most important business asset, the human element. Where's Bob? He's half an hour late. Well, you know, he looked kind of sick out at your house yesterday. Right after those steaks. Oh, now my cooking wasn't that bad. <laughs> yes. My wife sure put her on. Hello, Ruth. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't understand you. You said that Mary called. Are you sure? All right, dear. We'll be there right away. What's going on? Mary just called Ruth. Bob's had a heart attack. What? Bob's dead. No. I... I can't believe it. I told Ruth we'd be right over. And so they learned about another gamble in doing business. Well, as you can imagine, it was a rough shock. A firm cannot stand still. It must move constantly forward. The loss of Bob meant a loss in momentum. And replacing him immediately would be impossible. Besides, a new man wouldn't have Bob's contacts. They would have to do it all themselves. Things were happening that worried both men. That important feeling of confidence was fading. 
and it didn't help to have outsiders worried too. Both creditors and customers were wondering what arrangements had been made to carry on the business. Well, of course, we're going to miss him. But we're going ahead full steam. You know the old saying, no man is indispensable. Okay. Thanks for calling. Walter, there are a couple of things I wanted to check with you on. And both are bad, no doubt. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Henry just gave me his notice. Oh, no. He's the third one to quit. Why? I couldn't get much out of him. I think he's worried about our situation. Oh, boy, it never rains, but it pours. Which uh, reminds me, I thought you were going to check on that complaint. They were a good account. I haven't had time. I never have time to do anything right. Yeah, I know. Me too. Waller, do you think we can go ahead? Of course we can. We've got to. What about Mary? We've always said the families could look to the business for help if anything happened to one of us. We'll straighten things out with Mary later. Right now, she has Bob's insurance. We have enough to worry about. I'm afraid we'll have to consider it now. Mary's lawyer called. He's handling Bob's estate, and he wants to know what sort of financial arrangement we plan to make with her. Why can't we settle that with Mary? Do we have to deal with him? The estate's in probate, and he's handling Mary's affairs. That's all there is to it. He wants to see us, so I said we'd meet with him. I suppose that means money. We can't pay her Bob's salary. Well, we don't even have anyone to take his place. She couldn't. George, I'll tell you right now, as fond as we are of Mary, we can't be expected to do all the work and split equally with her when she can contribute nothing. Well, of course, Walter, but don't you feel we owe it to Bob? Isn't there some way we can take care of Mary without wrecking the business? You name it. I guess the best way would be to buy her out. With what? Well, how about out of future profits? That's possible, if she can wait. And providing we could agree on a price with Mary and her lawyer. If we can't, it's a sure thing she'll be thinking about selling to one of our competitors. Do you really think Mary would do that to us? Legally, she can sell to anybody she wants to, wherever she can get the highest price for the stock. But I don't think Mary would do that. I wouldn't be too sure of that, George. If she doesn't think of it, you can bet her lawyer will. We ought to be thankful we're incorporated. If we were still a partnership, she could have the court forces to liquidate. We should have had an agreement. We should have had an agreement, was what Waller said. Yes, a simple buy and sell agreement, made when all the partners were alive, would have eliminated what the two face now. It would have removed the fears, doubts, and confusion they now feel. You see, such an agreement would have bound Mary to sell her interest to the corporation or to Walter and George. It also would have required the corporation or Walter and George to buy. It would have been a different story. But then, of course, every story has two sides. Bob's widow, Mary, was shocked to discover that even though he had nearly $40,000 of life insurance, after paying doctor bills, funeral costs, and probate expenses, plus inheritance taxes, the amount she had left to last a lifetime for her and her children was less than Bob's salary for one year. Mary's lawyer was not interested in sentiment, but in a fair settlement for his client, and soon. Mary, I know how you feel about Walter and George. You don't wish to press them, but you simply must face facts. Now, let me see if I can summarize what we've been talking about for the last hour or so rather confusing. Yeah, I know, but it's most important. Now, we should demand that they buy you out, in cash, at a fair price. Now, we shouldn't accept terms, because without Bob there, we could never be sure of your getting your fair share. They would be getting the benefits of all the profits if everything goes well. If it doesn't, you would be the loser. Now, Mary, they're going to get everything they can out of this business if they see that it's going under. Now, believe me, even though there were relatives involved, my advice is still the same. 
Get your full and fair share of this business now. I suppose you're right. I know I am. Now, if they can't pay a fair cash price, we can insist that they give you an equal salary and an expense account. Or we'll threaten to sell to a competitor. Well, that's a possibility, I should think. It's a good business. Or was. We can take them to court and force them to pay dividends, make them justify every dime of salary and expense money that they draw. We can question every move they make. After all, there are laws to protect the minority stockholder. But, but they're my friends. <laughs> and no, Mary, it's difficult to tell what people will do when they're in a tough spot. And believe me, they're in one. But in all fairness to you, you must realize that your position is not a very happy one either. Well, what do you mean? I thought I owned one-third of the company. Bob always told me the business would take care of me and the children. Now, if this were a partnership, we could demand liquidation or a complete reorganization. But, Mary, since it's a corporation, they can, legally at least, attempt to continue. But where do I fit in the picture? Well, you are a minority stockholder with no control, and there was no agreement that required them to buy you out. And frankly, I don't think they could buy you out on any basis that would be satisfactory to us. Can't they just pay me cash? I'll sell. No, Mary, there is no cash. Like any other growing business, their cash is invested in the firm. Well, then, couldn't they borrow it? No, I'm afraid they couldn't borrow any more now under these conditions, especially without Bob. I wish I could take Bob's place. What did you mean about selling to a competitor? Well, like Bill Edwards. Uh, but, Mary, remember, it's, it's only a threat. Actually, who would want to buy a minority interest in a business situation like this? And at what kind of a price? I see what you mean. Well, then how about dividends? I thought when you owned stock, they paid you in dividends. Well, that depends. Most closely held corporations don't pay dividends. Walter and George will certainly not want to pay dividends if for no other reason than to avoid double taxes. They'd much rather take it in salaries, which are deductible by a corporation. And remember, they have majority control. Yes, I know. Now, Mary, I'm not saying that they'll do this, but I have seen it happen before. The owners will bleed the company of all earnings in the form of salaries and expense accounts. Oh, I can't believe that Walter and George would do that. Mary, with them having majority control and with the business needing cash, I'm afraid we'd have a hard fight forcing them to pay dividends. Anyway, you probably wouldn't get enough in dividends for you and the children to live on. You couldn't count on it for future income. I, I just can't understand it. Bob always said the business would take care of us in case something happened to him. Well, that's why he worked so hard. Why we did without so many things at first, to build the business. Now, Mary, try not to worry. That's why I've called this meeting with Walter and George. I guarantee we'll salvage something for you. Excuse me. Yes? Oh, uh, have them come right in, please. Now, Mary, try not to let your emotions sway you. This is more than a business meeting. The future of you and your children hinges on what happens here. You just let me handle it. A lifetime is at stake for Mary. And for George and Walter. The attorney will insist on a price and cash. George and Walter will try to save the business, which needs all their cash. Their careers are at stake. The important meeting began, and it soon became apparent they were working at cross purposes. After all, it was an almost impossible gamble that they could reach an agreement with such sharply conflicting interests. It's strange how old friendships can be wrecked so easily and so disastrously. They tried, all of them tried. But there just wasn't any answer. When Walter and George walked out, they closed the door on their hopes and dreams.
It happens every time. If only they'd made a simple, fair agreement while Bob was still alive. All of this could have been avoided. Well, it's too late now. gamble of doing business. Those three men were our top competition. And when my partners and I saw what happened, we realized that the whole tragedy could have been avoided if the three of them had made a suitable agreement. So we started looking around for the answer that would solve the problem for us. The experience of Bob, Walter, and George showed us what the hidden key really was. A binding agreement. And most important of all, the money to fund it. My business is different because I own the majority of the stock and my partners are in a minority position. We not only have their problems, but the additional one that if I should die first, my partners would have the burden of running the firm without control or power of decision. An impossible situation. Just how much would my stock be worth to my family then? Well, the agreement was easy. All we had to do was approximate the value of our interests and reach an understanding. The problem was money. Where was it to come from? Fortunately, we found a way to guarantee that the money would be available when needed. We'd never have to pay it back, nor would we have to take it out of our business at that time. Our plan works this way. Here are 100 pennies representing one full dollar of the purchase price. We agreed to deposit three cents in this first year. And if our agreement becomes operative, we would receive the full purchase price, 100 cents on the dollar tax-free. It would have cost us just these three pennies. If the agreement is not used until, say, five years, we will have paid in only 15 cents for each dollar required. And even in 20 years, we will have deposited only 60 cents for each full dollar. During all this time, a large percentage of these deposits will be available to our firm for our business use or emergencies. And if by chance we never need the money for this agreement and we all live to old age, a large part of these deposits can be used for our retirement. What really tickles us is that our creditors and our bank are just as pleased with this plan as we are. Now, you may be wondering where we found this hidden key. Well, it was handed to us by an insurance man who understood these business problems. And fortunately, we were all able to qualify medically. I suppose that doing business, that life itself is a gamble. But it's a sure thing that you or your family, sooner or later, will be on one side or the other of this inevitable conflict. Why not make use of this hidden key, business life insurance, in order to assure the security of your two most important responsibilities, your family and your business? tiresome checking all these sales figures, but when they show this kind of a profit picture, I can bear the pain. 
Yeah, things are pretty good. Pretty good. We're strong in our product lines. Our dealer volume is growing, and we're getting more dealers. Middleman. Yeah, the wholesaler is the man in the middle, between the manufacturer and the dealer. And we never even see the people who end up with the product on their cars. Yet we have to think of them, their interests, sell through, not to the dealer. Maybe I'm just being sensitive, but we don't seem as important to some people as the manufacturer or the dealer. Eliminate the middleman. Yeah. All you guys do is pass on this stuff and take your cut. Ho, ho, ho. Wholesaling's a hard, competitive game. And we don't just pick our dollars off of trees. Our customers need help, service, know-how. And they're going to do business with the people who will give it to them. So it's how we give that help. And the amount we give that gives us the edge over competition. It's, it's like a scale. An unkind or thoughtless word to a customer and we lose a little ground. A speedy delivery to help him out, we gain. Uh, back order, down again. Selling the AP gun deal, up again. Keep waiting on the phone, down again. How we weigh against competition is the total gain or loss based on every little thing we do, everything we say. And when I say we, I'm giving most of the credit to the three guys who speak for us to our customers. There's Pete, our outside salesman, our voice, the voice that calls on our customers and the voice that finds his new ones. And Joe, our counterman, is our voice on the phone and to our customers when they come in. And Marty is our voice too, the voice of our delivery service. Yeah, Pete, Joe, and Marty speak for us to our customers. And they can make or break our business. Of course, we have to have good lines, well-established key lines that offer programs to help us sell more, with promotions to help our dealers sell more. Like AP, for instance. But why not AP? Tops in the industry in our key line. Accounted for over 6% of our total volume last year. Then, on the other end, you got to have dealers. Guys like Johnny, who can recognize a good way to make money when he sees one. With manufacturers like AP, and lots of good customers like Johnny, we guys in the middle have a hell of an opportunity to go. AP gives us everything we need to put the Johnnies in the muffler business. The product, the promotion, even the tools to do the job everything Johnny needs to make some real money installing mufflers and pipes. And the more Johnny sells, the more we sell. But Johnny can't do it alone. To compete with the specialty shops, he needs our help and AP. Because competitive selling is lots and lots of little things like, well, take Marty, for instance. To some, he may be just our delivery man. But what he has to say can make a big difference with our customers. For instance... If you ordered them when you ordered the mufflers, I wouldn't have had to make this extra trip. Sorry I bothered you. Cut. Fortunately, this isn't the way it really is with Marty. Because Marty knows the importance of the impression he makes when he's representing us with customers. If you had one of APCA 60 clamp and bracket assortments, Johnny, you wouldn't have had to wait for me to get these out to you. CA 60? Yeah, 60 are the fastest moving clamps and brackets that handle 95% of the cars. And they come in a nice counter display. I'd like to know more about that. Yeah, tell Pete so he can fill you in on it next time he calls. Maybe Marty isn't known as a salesman, but when he shows a helpful interest in the customer, he can certainly have an effect on sales. And Marty knows about our products and merchandising. Though, of course, I guess all he would have to do with the delivery man is this. Here are the pipes you ordered. Yeah, thanks. But with a man like Marty, we've got an extra voice on our sales force. 
I sure like these non-rust pipes. I don't even get my hands dirty. Non-rust? Yeah, whether they're in stock two months or two years makes no difference. AP double coats them to stay clean until you install them. <laughs> it's a non-rust pipe cinch that Marty isn't going to stay a delivery man all his life. When a guy takes the trouble to learn about the products he handles and uses what he knows on behalf of the outfit he's working for, he can't go anywhere but up. When you realize that more than half our business comes over the counter, you know why Joe's an important voice in our sales picture. The only problem with Joe is he never learned how to talk to four customers at once. And I must admit, when Joe asks, what can I do about it? The whole I can come up with is, do the best you can, Joe. So I suppose Joe could start feeling sorry for himself. Like this. Look, you guys, I'm only human. One at a time, one at a time. Fortunately, Joe knows he's speaking for us. And the worst thing you can do with a customer is show you're irritated. The best way to keep customers from feeling they're just standing around waiting is to get them interested in something. While I've taken care of Louie's order, you guys might like to see how a good muffler is made. When Joe uses the AP cutaway, he as much as has AP take over talking to these customers. So he can give his full attention to one customer at a time. The counterman's in a key spot to steer a customer's interest toward things he should know about, if he keeps up on products. For instance, situations like this. How come they call them tough grip? I don't know. Maybe because they're tougher to get off. Fortunately, Joe knows the products he sells. They're called Tough Grip because they have a 360-degree seal all the way around. You don't need any sealer or cement when you replace a welded assembly. They're leak-proof. Have you seen AP's new universal bracket? What's new about it? Lots of things. Like fewer parts to handle. You can bend or twist the strap to fit just about any job. And it's got built-in lock washers. Now you tighten the nuts up from the bottom instead of from above where it's awkward. Oh, and you use only one wrench. It's a real time saver. So you'll have another edge competing with those 15-minute muffler shops. As one of our voices, Joe's our expert in looking things up in catalogs. But just because he's good at it doesn't make him impatient with dealers who aren't. You know, there are lots of drivers who still can't read road maps. And there are lots of dealers who have trouble with catalogs, even APs, the most complete catalog in the industry, laid out to make finding what you need as easy as possible. And the last thing you do, if you want to keep their goodwill, is to talk down to them or make them feel foolish. The rest of us get to take on customers one at a time. <laughs> but they often come at Joe like parents descending on the umpire after a Little League baseball game. Yeah, we got it. Sorry this is taking so long, Johnny. You might take a look at that gun deal while you're waiting. It's a beaut. Gun deal? Joe's using his voice and bringing in AP's voice, too, to push a sale. We don't make anything on the gun and four chisels, but we get our full profit on the four mufflers that go with the deal, just as if we sold them separately at stocking dealer prices. You can get that gun with AP's special deal. I've always wanted one of these. It's the main thing you need to make extra money installing mufflers. We've been selling them out as fast as we can get them in. And it's even a better gun than they'd had for the past couple of years. I thought I'd heard they had three chisels. Added a new one to save time in cutting off old clamps and brackets. Oh, go on. This chisel doesn't look rugged enough. You want to bet? Just hook it up to your air hose. And AP lends us another voice when one of their dealer sales corps goes along with Pete on his dealer call. AP's DSC men are specially trained to show our dealers how to make money as muffler specialists. With the right kind of tools, you can lick any competition. Our new gun has instant power and a better valving system that won't wear out. And you've got four exclusive chisels designed and patented by AP to do the complete job and make 15-minute installation on most cars a cinch, a cutoff chisel for straight cuts an outside cut chisel, an inside cut chisel, and the new AP all-purpose clap and bracket chisel helps you sell the complete installation job faster. How do I get one? As easily as anything good that's ever happened to you before, Johnny. 
First, you buy just four popular mufflers, the best movers, and you pay a regular price of 38 bucks. And you pay the regular price of $20.50, you get the four patented chisels, the metal toolbox, and the muffler installation manual, loaded with pictures and tips on how to handle any installation job faster. And the gun? You get the whole deal for $58.50, $124.30 retail value. You also get your full profit on labor, pipes, clamps, and brackets when you install the mufflers. Oh, we little guys can't compete with all those big chain operations that are trying to push us out. You couldn't be more wrong, Johnny. The only way they can take business away from you is for you to give it away to them. The specialty repair shop has to make the business come to them. Why, you get yours regularly. You see most of your customers two or three times a week, and you get first crack at their business. And if you want their business, you have to do two things. Look for opportunities to help your customers by calling their attention to anything wrong with their exhaust system and install quickly and efficiently. Let them know you're concerned with their cars and their safety. Give them fast service, use good tools, and you're gonna make money. Although we take advantage of all the help we can schedule from the DSC men, Pete is a good voice on his own, too. But before I get into that, I just want to pause a moment to shudder over the way some salesmen can kill a day's worth of time. Well, not Pete, but let's use Pete to show what I mean. First, a few laughs. Well, been beating your mother-in-law lately, you old reprobate? Oh, sure. Once a day and twice on Sundays. How about yours? I understand you entered your mother-in-law in the fourth race at Hialeah. No, I had to scratch her. Couldn't find a jockey, take a chance. <laughs> a few more insults. And then on to the news program. Hey, hear about old Charlie Brown in the hospital? Oh, sorry to hear it. Who is he, a friend of yours? Oh, I thought maybe you knew him. Jerry down Star Garage told me he thought Charlie used to work here. Never heard of him. Must have been before my time. Well, uh, well, what else is new? Oh, nothing much. Things are getting a little tougher all the time. Yeah, sure do. Ought to be some way they could keep too many people going into the same business in one area. And then, after more such inspirational repartee, it's time to sell, sell, sell. Well, need anything today? Mm. Nope. Can't think of a thing. I'm a little low on plugs, but I'll phone in when I need more. Well, okay. Uh, don't take any wooden nickels, and I'll see you sometime next week. <laughs> Fortunately, this isn't the way Pete operates. Pete's a guy who figures that as long as he's putting in his time, he might just as well put out that little extra effort that makes his calls profitable. Pete doesn't just call on customers, he sells. He's worked it out pretty good. Each week, he features one item from his key lines. So he has something of real interest to a busy dealer every time he calls. AP being our top line, he gets to it six or eight times a year. One time, it's the quality story, using AP's cutaway. AP thinks heavier weight is so important to quality and long life, they keep putting in more steel, which costs them more. And then add coatings over their thicker steel on most numbers and still sell them at the same price. Now, AP puts this extra measure of quality into their product to protect your reputation, to ensure you satisfied customers. Now, I don't mean AP isn't in business to make a profit, but they think the best way is on volume sales with a top quality product. And to prove they're right, just check on their top position in the muffler industry, and they've stayed on top for years. What's with this uh, dry flow design, Pete? Well, we all know a dry muffler lasts longer, and dry flow is the best method ever designed to spread heat evenly throughout the muffler, so there are no cold spots or hot spots, just even heat. You can't tell much just looking at it. Well, that's why AP had an independent testing laboratory prove that their mufflers run drier, give less back pressure, and last longer than any other competitive design. Another time, Pete will sign them up for AP's Muffler Specialist Program. Here's another service AP offers you as a registered AP Muffler Specialist. You get catalogs, price sheets, sales tips, and installation data the minute they're available, right from the factory. It saves time. Keeps you completely informed on this key line at all times. And you get AP dealer news regularly, crammed with shop tips, sales ideas, and new developments. Then you get these inspection tags to put on the cars you service. 
They'll help sell replacements for you. Your customers will know you're taking care of their cars. Sounds good. Where's the catch? There isn't any. There's nothing for you to buy but an idea. Another time, Pete makes the rounds with an AP glass pack muffler. Only AP gives you two types, oval, that looks like OE, and round, with a special combination of two kinds of fiberglass to deliver those deep power tones. At least once a year, Pete pushes AP's giant all-service sign. This sign, Johnny, will let everyone know you're a one-stop service expert, and it'll help you cancel out the local advertising of your competitors. Also keeps reminding your own men you're in the repair business solid. I got some of these signs out now. Oh, but too many different signs clutter up the place. This one sign over seven feet tall will sell all your high profit services. How do I go about getting one? Oh, it's a good deal, Johnny. You buy the AP multi-service sign and wind anchor attachments for $54.95, you get four fast moving mufflers free. You sell them for $53.95 at a net cost to you of only $1, which is more than offset when you consider you make full profit on labor, pipes, clamps, and brackets when you install them. You couldn't ask for a better deal than that, Johnny. And so it goes. Of course, it isn't all AP with Pete. He has to cover all his lines. But since AP's our key line and our highest profit line, he gives AP the attention it deserves. You know, every book or article I've ever seen on selling is emphasized dramatizing your pitch with pictures, action demonstrations, testimonials, and printed evidence. It's all a matter of communication. Have you seen AP's new acoustatone muffler? No. What's it like? Well, there's no actual muffler, you know, like you'd expect. Uh, well, that is, the whole thing looks like a big, long tailpipe, uh, only, well, it, it's slightly different. Though. You see, they, they've strung out these 16 silencing chambers in a row, and uh, words alone just aren't as effective as pictures, or better yet, the product itself. AP is pioneering this new idea in mufflers, just as they've been first with most new ideas in the exhaust system industry. There are still new things to come in the muffler business. And tied in with AP, we know we're going to be the first to launch them in our area. Of course, this means that Pete and Joe and Marty and all of us who are the voices of our business have to keep up on our products. The latest in product features, the latest in merchandising, like this article I've just been reading in Sales Management, bringing national attention to the thinking behind AP's new dealer sales corps, working coast to coast for guys just like me. Well, that's the picture, as I see it. With our sales voices going good at three levels, on outside sales, on the phone, and at the counter, and with our delivery service, we're going to hit the high road men in the middle. On top of that, you add the backup of a key line like AP. You got everything going for you. Product. Thicker steels, more coated steel, and dry flow design. Glass pack, oval or round. They'll stay clean until they're installed. Forms a perfect seal all around. Makes installations quicker, easier. You don't have to wait for me to get them out to you. Most complete catalog in the industry. The tools to compete for profit. It'll put you in the muffler installation business. Cut off chisel. Outside cut chisel. Inside cut chisel. Clamp and bracket remover. And a 36 page manual to show you the way to muffler installation profits. Yeah, AP has other tools too, like their time saving pipe expander. And the promotion that sells through the dealer. Sells 21 traffic building services. Sign on as an AP specialist. Direct from AP all year long. Keep up with the latest. The largest trade ad program in AP's history pre-sells AP quality and AP's dealer deals for you. And AP pre-sells millions of motorists for you in hard-hitting consumer advertising campaigns. AP gives us a lot of direct help, too. Counter displays, promotion signs and decals, wall and counter displays, decal kits for our truck that save money, imprinted caps, tags and labels, and giveaway items. Stocking aids like this perpetual inventory system, stock check sheets, helpful information on stocking methods, inventory control. In fact, AP's territory manager showed us how to stock our pipes by length. So we're saving a lot of space. Well, maybe I forgot a few things, but 
By now, you should know that I believe in selling the complete package on a key line like AP. Oh, one more thing that should interest you. AP had an unmatched delivery record last year. 98.5% without back orders. If our three voices don't do their job unusually well, all that AP puts in their product and promotion wouldn't mean a thing in the marketplace. And how is all this paid off for us? Well, with AP and our three good sales voices, we're doing 60% of the muffler business in town against three other distributors. How about you? sets world record of 131 miles per hour with mobile oil. Nineteen twenty seven. Mobile oil was there with Charles Lindbergh on the first non-stop transatlantic flight to Paris. In the tradition of leadership that has created a worldwide reputation for quality, mobile oil now brings you another first. New Mobile Oil Super 10W40, the world's finest 10W40 motor oil. The one unbeatable candidate who has proven himself all over the world, the true champion for 1968. But no breakthrough is accomplished overnight. It takes time and effort. In our laboratories, through careful study and evaluation, we came up with the outstanding candidate. Here at Paulsboro, New Jersey, one of the most modern scientific research and development centers in the world, careful consideration was given automotive needs and public desires in developing an oil to meet today's driving demands. Today's automobile engines are marvels of power and performance. They're the most powerful engines built in this decade by car manufacturers. Engine design improvements have increased the demands on the oil used for engine lubrication. Oil has to work harder, so the operating conditions demand a top oil. We also have talked to the motoring public, carefully studied their views to find out what they expect and want most in a motor oil. We have compared and tested our candidate's performance against the best competition in the race. And we know that our candidate can stand on his record. Here's how that record stacks up. Today's oil has to keep engines clean from sludge and dirt that forms during driving. It must hold this dirt suspended in the oil so it doesn't form deposits that create engine damage. It must disperse that dirt until it can be drained. After 6,000 miles of driving, here is how Mobile Oil Super 10W40 compared with the leading competitive 10W40 oil. In the rocker arm covers, Mobile Oil Super 10W40 comes clean. But the competition is already failing. Look at the results on the oil screen. Our Super almost perfectly clear and free of deposit. The competition? is beginning to clog. Before long, it will be choking the engine. Today's oil must protect against rust and corrosion caused by acids that form during driving. Again, during the most severe driving tests, both in the lab and in the field, Mobile Oil Super 10W40 proved superior. Here on the valve lifters, which are required to carry such heavy loads with today's engines, with our Super, they remain free of corrosion and wear. 
with the other oil that is supposed to protect, damage and wear are already clearly visible. Let's look at the pistons, where extreme heat and friction can cause baked on varnish deposits. Super has done its job well. The competing oil has fallen behind again. Let's take a look at the PCV valves, one of the most critical areas of engine protection in a car today. With Mobile Oil Super 10W40, there is little or no clogging. With the other 10W40, its protection isn't half as good. These deposits will eventually clog the valve, and the contaminants forced into the oil can ruin an engine. Mobile Oil Super has clearly outdistanced its best competition, both in cleanliness and engine protection. And what did our survey find that the motorist wanted most? Cleanliness and protection. Driving conditions today demand the most in performance. Today's motorists drive longer at higher speeds on super highways. In city driving and commuting, the cars must contend with super congestion, short stop and start driving. This type of driving is hardest of all on engines and oil, especially in cold weather. Both on the road and here at the laboratory, comparison tests were made on cold weather starting. In these refrigerated rooms, sophisticated instruments accurately determine the performance ability of the oil in zero degrees. Our super proved its ability as a true 10W with plenty of reserve. This means less battery drain, less fuel waste, with faster cold weather starts. The competitive oil that claims a 10W40 rating actually is no better than a 20W. In long distance and hot weather driving, where oil tends to thin out and to shear, break down because of pressure, our super maintains its viscosity well above the required rating. It remains stable with a reserve power that competition can't match. This saves on consumption too. Tested in all types of cars, in all types of conditions, our super averaged 30% less consumption than a premium 10W30 oil. And in some cases, it was as high as 55%. And talk about smooth running and less engine noise. Let's listen to the results of an informal test that was done on cars picked at random from the parking lot. We'll show you on a sound meter. This is a 1962 Ford, before Mobile Oil Super 10W40 was added. Now, 15 minutes after Mobile Oil Super was added, And now, after 200 miles of driving, let's repeat that again. Let's hear that change once more. Out of the many cars we tested, this was a typical result. Once again, in performance, Mobile Oil Super 10W40 surpassed all competition. And what did we find the next most important thing the public wanted? Performance benefits. Mobile Oil Super 10W40 has it all the way. And what was the other motorist concern? An oil that meets car manufacturer's warranty requirements. Well, Mobile Oil Super 10W40 exceeds warranty requirements of all U.S. car builders. And that's a promise. A promise that is displayed proudly. Mobile Oil Super 10W40 is a major breakthrough. That's why we say it's the world's first true 10W40 motor oil that has been proven in performance tests all over the world and fulfills all of the motorists' desires. It keeps the engine clear of sludge and deposits. It protects against rust and corrosion and wear. It keeps PCV systems working properly. It gives faster, easier, cold and hot weather starts. It doesn't thin out and break down under extreme driving conditions. It reduces engine noise. It provides up to 30% less consumption. And it exceeds warranty requirements of all US car builders. 
our super candidate, Mobile Oil Super 10W40, the motor oil that is right for all cars and all driving conditions without exception. In 24 hours of driving at high speed, two cars will have taken the punishment of two years of steady highway driving. A 24-hour endurance trial. What does it mean? How did it begin? And what does it do for the average motorist? In 1927, the first actual 24-hour stock car test was run at Indianapolis Speedway for the Stevens Challenge Trophy. At the end of 24 hours, a standard Stutz five-passenger sedan had covered 1,642.58 miles at an average speed of 68 and 44 one-hundredths miles per hour. Today, a 1962 Pontiac will break a record that has stood since 1954, making the run of 2,586 miles at over 107 miles per hour. And so again, the average automobile owner benefits as even greater effort is made to improve cars and equipment. An endurance trial for men, a team of men, in concerted effort, working around the clock for top performance, for record breaking. Ray Nichols of Highland, Indiana, president of Nichols Engineering Company, directs operations. He supervises all phases of the work, especially the safety devices for protection of his drivers. Ray has selected the best men in the racing fraternity to be part of the pit crew. Smokey Unit, that fellow with the 10 gallon hat. Veteran mechanic, Tiny Worley. Top NASCAR driver, Cotton Owen. Bud Moore, ace NASCAR mechanic. All members of the crew are busy with final preparation. In the pit, an axle ratio change for better acceleration out of the corner. One of several optional ratios listed by Pontiac. More activity in these garages on the cars and component parts. They will be inspected and sealed by United States Automobile Club officials who supervise the run. They'll place their stamp of approval on a multitude of parts, stock products available to the general public. Since Ray Nichols originated the idea of the run, let's get some answers from him on parts, fuel, and equipment. On a run like this, we can use replacement parts that are available through the normal uh, trade channels. On this run, uh, the brakes are going to take a tremendous beating. So uh, we have selected uh, Raybestos uh, brake lining. We feel that uh, this lining, like I go back and say again, throughout the season we race on this type of lining and that, so we're sure that we won't have any problem here in 24 hours. These shocks uh, can be purchased right over the counter through uh, the Monroe dealers and uh, their uh, service stores throughout the United States. There's nothing special about the shock. And uh, again, I say we race on uh, Monroe's throughout the season, and uh, we anticipate no shock problems here at the Indianapolis Speedway. Uh, we're using um, uh, Burton Springs, manufactured by the Burton Spring Company. Uh, their uh, suppliers to uh, the automotive industry is original equipment. And uh, the reason we're using them is uh, they helped uh, Goldsmith and I win uh, the 1961 uh, National Stock Car Championship. Ray, have you used Pedrick rings before with this type of high-performance engine? Uh, we've been using uh, Pedrick uh, for years. 
And uh, I might point out that uh, Paul Goldsmith won the uh, USAC championship using Pedrick rings. And we anticipate no oil problem at, in this 24-hour run. Well, on a run like this, uh, the plugs uh, are really going to take a beating, and uh, you select the best uh, that's available. Do you feel that the Presto Light spark plugs will be able to stand up for the full 24 hours? I'm not the least bit worried about it. We also understand you'll be using a Presto Light battery in the run. Uh, yes, I'm not uh, the least bit concerned about the battery because uh, we're also running the Presto Light alternator. Well, we've been racing uh, all season on uh, Presto Light uh, uh, ignition equipped automobiles and have never had a failure. We select the Dow. Uh, we race uh, these cars, like I say, in real hot climate uh, down through the south net with the Dow full fill coolant, and we have absolutely no problem with it. And now the radiator is sealed, and uh, the only time we can even check the coolant is with the United States uh, Auto Club official to break the seal. These are the same tires that we've been racing on uh, on the circuit, uh, places like Milwaukee and Trenton and uh, various tracks around the country. Got a set up here that Goodyear uh, brought down that uh, if it does uh, happen to catch us late in the run with rain and that, when we're too far along to stop and start over, then we will go to their softer compounds and try and maintain enough speed to still break the record. The uh, United States Auto Club officials will sample the gas, make sure that it's just regular pump fuel that can be bought uh, at any standard oil station, and the same applies to the motor oil. We're going to use a, a regular 30 uh, weight oil. This, then, is the 24-hour challenge, the toughest stock car endurance trial known today. Time, the important element in the endurance trial. Official USAC timing devices will clock every split second of the run. A team composed of the cream of NASCAR drivers and the finest chauffeurs from USAC. Indy drivers Roger Ward, Len Sutton, and Paul Goldsmith. NASCAR men Fireball Roberts, Marvin Panch, and Joe Weatherly. They draw lots to determine rotation in which they will drive from U.S. Auto Club Director of Competition, Henry Banks. Rivalry is forgotten as they face together a blustery, cold November 20th. The run at the Brickyard is about to start. They stand on it as starter Frankie Bain waves them on with 24 hours to go. They'll hit speeds over 125 miles per hour in the grueling test of cars and men. leader, the police enforcer, and riding on its tail, the Catalina. Sizzling across the brick, all that remains of the original brick track. The official electronic timer clocks the first laps over 118 miles per hour. The action is fast in the first half hour, and both cars quickly tick off the laps. Lap after lap goes by and the driving is smooth, with both cars hitting average speeds of 117 to 120 miles per hour. Suddenly, on the 21st lap, Paul Goldsmith runs into trouble. In Paul's words, here's what happened. Well, the, uh, coming off the fourth corner up here, it seemed like our throttle was having a little trouble with it. And I was paying a lot of attention to the uh, throttle, and I just touched the wall a little bit, and I must have cut a tire. Right there. 
Ball is back on the track in four minutes, 47 seconds. A real tribute to this pit crew. Almost five valuable minutes have been lost in this unscheduled pit stop. Meanwhile, Marvin Panch in the Catalina is pushing for increased speed. It doesn't take the Southern boys long to get the feel of this immense Hoosier track. Into the pit for fast service. Four tires and a tank of gas. A driver change. Almost an hour's work in less than a minute. sight to see the teamwork of expert race mechanics working against the clock matching their skill and know-how with any possible trouble that could arise to threaten this 24-hour challenge hour after hour these men not only keep their cars running in perfect condition they also battle the bitter cold that makes the run more difficult and now as the day draws to a close they must battle darkness the night driving continues at speeds that could wreck the average driver. The laps pile up as the hours slide by. Bright headlights. The light of the full moon. Smudge spots to mark the corners. These the only light to see by it at breakneck speed. The Catalina swings from the dark track to the flood-lighted pit area. Work in the pit moves even faster as all realize that there's a chance to break the old 500-mile record. Darkness and predicted fog threaten their chances. Marvin Panch will take over the wheel from Roger Ward. And Roger, asked how the car is holding up under the terrific pounding, says... And I feel that all of the uh, uh, parts that we're using with the automobile and things like the shocks and the other things are holding up very well. In spite of Paul Goldsmith's accident, which cost him precious minutes, the police enforcer is pushing harder to break the old 500-mile record. But the outstanding performance of the companion Catalina makes possible the setting of a new record. The old 500-mile record is broken by the Catalina with Goldsmith at the wheel. At an average speed of 113.292 miles per hour. Now they've got something to talk about as they settle down to the long grind ahead. Some relax with a steaming cup of coffee. Others rest, while still others go on with the work. For the 24-hour challenge is a demanding one. day dawns, the official timer chalks up more and more impressive lap figures. But dawn also brings worry to Ray Nichols. A drizzle has begun and could affect the speed and safety of the drivers. Taking those slippery corners at over 100 plus miles per hour is treacherous. Calls for tires that stick, for speed tempered with safety. And the tires on this slick track, let's ask Roger Ward. Actually, I think they're doing a, a real good job, uh, much better than I had anticipated they would, because normally a racing tire or a tire such as this uh, for this kind of a run is of a hard compound and it wouldn't stick too good in the wet weather, but this tire is doing a, a real great job. It certainly has added to the safety of the run. It begins to look as if the previous record will be broken, despite the bad weather. Even with rain causing hazardous driving conditions, they score an almost unbelievable average of over 108 miles per hour. Hold it 
down, boys. Let's get as many safe miles as possible between now and 3 p.m. What does a driver himself think of these weather conditions? Most well, all the drivers out here have years and years of experience behind them and uh, under every kind of condition, and we pretty well know what we're doing. Uh, it was sort of bad out there on the, floor, on the last turn coming down to home shoot there where they put that new pavement in. Awful slick that. Full bore for 23 and a half hours. Not a single misfire. Engines performing smoothly on ordinary gasoline and lubricant. At 10.56 a.m., the enforcer equals the old record of 2,157.5 miles. is running up. And there's that famous Brickyard finish line. With Roger Ward and the police enforcer finishing first. Followed by Len Sutton driving the Catalina. The official record, the police enforcer 107.787 miles per hour for 2,586.878 miles. And the Catalina 107.343 miles per hour for 2,576.241 miles. Congratulations, Ray Nichols. Congratulations, Roberts, Hatch, Weatherly, Ward, Sutton, and Goldsmith. And thanks to the boys in the pit. Hot news for the automotive world, but there's one other open track endurance record still standing, and Ray Nichols wants to shoot for it. A second 24-hour challenge to be run on the home grounds of the Southern NASCAR drivers. Darlington Speedway in South Carolina, home of the famous Southern 500. Here, a team of drivers, including Paul Goldsmith, with Smokey Eunuch turning the wrenches, set the old record in 1956. They averaged over 101 miles per hour for 24 hours. Bob Colvin, president of Darlington Raceway, is happy to see all of his boys back on the track for another record run. Darlington is tougher than Indianapolis. It's half the size, with banks as high as 18 degrees. Experience isn't enough. It takes practice to stay in the groove. Only inches from the steel guardrail. A slight mistake, and you're into the cotton field. Ray Nichols cautions against overconfidence. We can't make any mistakes here. Hold a high average speed, but don't take unnecessary chances. NASCAR officials set up the electric eye. Before we're through, it may be tripped over 3,700 times. The flag is poised. The cars are ready to roll. And the second 24-hour challenge has begun. lap and are they barreling along. The first lap over 100 miles per hour from a standing start. chilling drive, just brushing that steel guardrail could result in tragedy. You've got
got to drive twice as many laps, twice as many turns, and the straights are shorter. You fight the wheel, taking a turn, and up comes another. Darlington, harder on the car, harder on the equipment, harder on the driver. stop coming up, one made each hour and ten minutes at Darlington. Late afternoon, the crew hurry to rack up as many miles as possible before darkness and its risks close in. How are the brakes? How's she running? Smokey wants to know. Paul Goldsmith has the answer. out in the back stretch and the engine endures temperatures up to 1400 degrees. Piston rings and valves are operating at double the normal driving temperature. Early evening. Now it's up to the headlights and the smudge spots to show the way. per hour at the 500 mile mark. Ray Nichols and his pit crew have done it again. The painstaking hours of work on these cars is paying off. The boys find time for a breather between pit stops. What does a racing driver think of during the lonely night? His golf game, what he'll do when the run is over, his mind is on his work. How's the engine doing? Feel out those tires. Those turns, got to watch them. It's tricky here at Darlington. Got to stay on it. Gets harder as the miles grind away. Got to stay alert. And in the pit, questions. Questions such as, how's the coolant doing? Has the temperature gone up? Fireball Robert says. Oh, it's remained constant at uh, whatever the thermostat's holding the, uh, the temperature in the car. It's never changed since we started. Brakes have been getting heavy use on the Darlington run. What does Joe Weatherly think of them? Uh, the brakes have done a real good job for us on this run, and I was really surprised the way they uh, turned out for this run. Quarters mark, 18 hours, speed over 109 miles per hour, 138 miles ahead of the Darlington record, 25 miles ahead of the Indianapolis mark. At the pit stops, Ray Nichols questions the drivers on how the shocks are holding up. I've questioned the drivers on that and uh... Everyone uh, feels that they are working just as well now as they were when we started. Are the engines still putting out the same horsepower? The drivers seem to feel that they're getting stronger all the time because uh, we haven't uh, had to uh, look at a plug or a thing. We have checked the oil. We've added a couple quarts of oil, like I would guess, to uh, each engine. down the home stretch, and they piled up a lead of 156 miles over the old record. The old mark of 2,438 miles falls at 1.22 p.m. December. Tearing up that old record means tearing up the Indianapolis record, too. Now, just a matter of piling up mileage before the 24-hour challenge is ended. 
and staying out of trouble so as not to endanger the run. Taking the checkered flag, the Pontiac Police Enforcer. And seconds behind, the Catalina. Time for real jubilation as the townspeople look on. The Police Enforcer racked up 2,612.5 miles at an average speed of 108.818 miles per hour for 24 hours. The Catalina came in with 2,575.375 miles at 107.288 miles per hour. Records are made to be broken, and the drivers and the pit crew of the Indianapolis and Darlington runs took the challenge. Ray Nichols, a man with an idea. The idea that a Pontiac automobile and its component parts could meet the 24-hour challenge and outrun any other car for those 24 hours. Men and machines performed this feat under conditions the average motorist would not experience in a lifetime of driving. Working as a team, drivers, mechanics, all concerned have faced and surmounted the 24-hour challenge. Skiing today is one of our fastest growing sports, sweeping the world with an overwhelming appeal as an outlet for excitement and pleasure. Now a new trend in the skiing family has been developed that will enable thousands of water ski enthusiasts to enjoy additional thrills by skimming over the top of the water without the aid of skis. The new sport is called skedding, and all the additional equipment a skier requires is a pair of kids. The skier takes off in the usual manner. When reaching a speed of approximately 40 miles an hour, the skier merely steps off the ski onto the water and holds on tight. The skeddick can continue at this pace for quite some time without tiring and he will sked as long as he keeps his toes out of the water. to stop, the skedder must throw himself back, bringing his feet in the air. Now let's take a closer look at the same skedding scenes and see how it's done. The skier carefully places his left heel in the water with his toes up. Momentarily, when he's discarding his ski, the skier is riding on his left foot. He then places his right foot in the water approximately 12 to 15 inches astride the left foot, cutting the water at the same angle. When he gets his balance and his weight is evenly distributed, the skier is actually skimming along the surface of the water on his heels. His toes are slightly up in the air. Looking at the stop again, the skater releases his hold on the tow rope, throwing himself backward and bringing his feet in the air. I like to say with a man who has a hard stomach, a strong back and a cheerful smile. And there's something else. It starts way back. And no amount of experience can compensate for the lack of it. I mean, I like a thinking sailor. The man who sees what needs doing on the deck in an emergency. The man at the wheel who's always alert, alive to sail trim, 
wind shift, weather, and a man who was sure of his footwork on deck. There are many things a good sailor must know. The right kind of sailor starts young. No one trains him as well as he can train himself. And he starts out even before he steps aboard by making sure the boat doesn't get away after launching, even if he has to enlist the services of his companion. The good sailor realizes that footwork is of greatest importance. And he knows that the footwork starts the moment he or anyone else takes their first step aboard. So he makes sure that everyone, himself included, has on the proper footgear so he won't slip while walking on deck or along the gunnels. The good sailor is sure of his footing no matter what he does aboard. And this holds true whether he's lowering a motor or power boat or putting on a jib or raising a halyard on a sailboat. Experience is a wonderful teacher. So after you've read one or two good books on boating and perhaps taken your boat out by yourself several times to get the feel of it, you want to show off to your best girl what a good seaman you really are without embarrassing moments. It's suggested that you find a nice quiet stream without much traffic. Try to remember everything you've read and concentrate on your footwork from the moment you step on board. In addition to just walking on deck, sea legs and sure-footedness is necessary in the performance of most of the odd jobs that are required on board a boat, such as dropping anchor or throwing the anchor overboard, whatever the case may be. The good sailor not only gets a good footing when dropping anchor, but he also sees to it that the rope is in order so that he doesn't get snarled up in it. And he again makes sure of his footing when he's hoisting anchor, or the command is away anchors. Proper footgear is essential for steady footing on any type boat. Now there are several styles available such as these mainsails that the boatman can choose from. It's suggested however that the bottom of the shoes be of special construction to prevent slipping on wet decks and other sections of the boat. <laughs> 